I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome everyone to Women's Health Tech Wednesdays. My name is Nina Joshi and with us today we have the wonderful Julia mofrini Peeve, the general partner at Pace Healthcare Capital. Uh, before we jump in, just wanted to give a quick background on myself. I work as a consultant and design researcher at Kaiser Permanente's Health Innovation Shop, where I design and deploy digital health solutions. Uh, before we bring on our guest, also just wanted to quickly remind everyone that the applications are still open for the Women's uh, Health Tech Challenge that will be taking place in December, and the deadline is the 20th of this month, so please make sure to submit your application. And with that, I will bring out our amazing guest, Julia. Welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Nina. So excited to be here. So, so maybe to, to start things off, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background. Sure, sure. So again, thank you so much for, for having me today. Um, it's an honor to be able to come to HIT Lab Women's Health Tech Wednesday and talk about tech innovation in, in women's health. So my name is Julia monfrini Um, By way of background, I have spent 12 of the last 16 years investing in healthcare now. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> the bulk of my career is in private equity where I have invested um, over a billion dollars of, of capital uh, in transactions big and small. You, you get to a billion faster with the larger transactions yeah. than the smaller ones. <laughs> but that, uh, in terms of um, path I have, uh, I was first at a mid-market firm called Monitor Clipper Partners in Europe and then in the US. Um, and then I became co-head for healthcare direct private equity mm -hmm. at CDPQ in their New York office, looking after North America and, and Latin. Uh, and I left about um, two years ago to, to start PACE, um, PACE Healthcare Capital. So let me tell you a little bit about the journey and yeah. why I became an investor. Um, if my accent has not betrayed me by now, I was born <laughs> in France. <laughs> um, and I grew up in the family business back there. My dad was an entrepreneur and my mother had no choice and she became an <laughs> entrepreneur too. Um, I know therefore what it takes to have a vision, execute on it, go after that first customer contract and the next and, and the one after. And I'd say more importantly, I also know what it takes to build an organization to support and deliver on, on that vision. So, you know, the family business was very successful in some years and, and also had some um, big difficulties in, in other ones. It wasn't always easy. So I learned my most valuable lessons about business there, not in business school, not after, but just really there watching my parents build their own. And that stayed with me. Um, mm -hmm. Investments aren't just numbers on the page and all entrepreneurs know that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many more dimensions that go into it. And so in order to be effective as an investor, my job is not just to deploy financial capital. It's also to deploy human capital to help the best teams, the best businesses grow and really almost like a concierge service mm -hmm. to support hire the next um, talent for the team or make introductions yeah. and whatnot. And that philosophy guided my investments as a private equity investor, but also now as, a, as an early stage um, investor. That's incredible. And I really love that holistic approach where it isn't just numbers, but it really is just that level of guidance and support, um, especially for you know, those in early stage who, who definitely will need it. Um, that's amazing. Absolutely right. Can you tell us a little bit more about Pace Healthcare and kind of the genesis behind that organization and how it came to be? Sure, sure. So first, I, I will start um, about the sector healthcare. I fell in love with the sector a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, professionally and quite literally as well. My <laughs> husband is a doctor. So, you know, what we do to improve care is our regular topic on <laughs> our kitchen table. And I, I even went back to when we immigrated to the US, um, I went back to becoming a student at the Harvard Kennedy School because the US healthcare system is so complex and I come from mm. a single payer country. So I wanted to know better how it functions, but also what is it we can do as investors to really advance, advance the field. And I would say 
um, uh, that is one of the guiding principles around, around PACE. In healthcare private equity, I had invested across the board, uh, healthcare providers, service providers to the life science industry and so on. And I was fascinated by technology and how it had the potential to transform healthcare. But yet there were clearly many areas that were underinvested. Mm -hmm. um, for one, um, VC is not a cookie cutter strategy mm -hmm. and many early stage businesses need a slightly different approach than what's the mainstream VC approach nowadays. And let, let me explain. Whenever my private equity investments were trying to deploy software to mm -hmm. either reach out to patients or automate parts of their business, they were often partnering with small companies that actually could not raise capital from traditional VCs. Right. And, you know, traditional VCs, they do a great job at um, B2B to C, B2C and whatnot. But when we're in the trenches of healthcare, it was becoming a little bit esoteric. And mm -hmm. those businesses, actually, we knew by surveying the competitive landscape that they were the best to serve mm -hmm. my investments. They had the best product market fit. And they were maybe not becoming unicorns, but they certainly had a very strong trajectory ahead of them. They had just landed the largest contract in the industry after all. And right. they should have been good investments to somebody. If we sort of think a little bit differently mm -hmm. about how much capital we deploy behind those companies and how long it's going to take to get to scale. And maybe right. we can be more mindful about profitability as well. And that, that was one of the first areas I was interested in. Mm -hmm. The second area, clearly, there are several sectors that are completely overlooked. Uh, and women's health was a great example. It was true in private equity, and it's even more true in early stage. Mm -hmm. um, it's in, underinvested in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals and research. Um, after all, women only started being included in clinical trials in 1993. This is when millennials were born. It was yesterday when it, yeah. you know, it takes 10 years to get a new drug to market. That's three cycles, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, we're really behind. And so large pharma didn't think that, you know, um, they thought drugs could react differently around women's hormones. There, there was a concern around how it could impact our reproductive system. So not saying it was so bad, but certainly now, now is a good time to start moving on. And so there's still so much we don't know. And I would say the same applies to healthcare technologies. Yeah. Um, it, it's clear that we can do a lot by harnessing data and putting tools in the hands of women mm -hmm. to track what happens with their cycles, to track what happens during a pregnancy, to get access to content, to get access to support, right. and not just around childbearing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> women for a long time before and after that. And there's a lot going on in our lives. And yeah. so I think we've just um, started scratching the surface. And if you look at how well businesses have done around men's health, right? Mm -hmm. um, the blue pills and whatnot, yep. those sectors have exploded. So yeah. will we see an explosion for women's health? Nobody knows, but certainly there is a potential there. And that's one of the reasons I started PACE is really so that we can go after those investments and, and deploy, as I said, not just financial capital, but also human capital. So the way I'm working with my advisors and operating partners to build the firm is really around that. How can we bring the best experts and the best talent to support investments in those categories? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm lucky to have four operating partners slash senior advisors. Michael Williams, who spent 30 years in the life science industry and healthcare tech as a chief commercialization officer, usually in C-suite roles. Um, he's excellent to figure out how to unlock that next layer of growth. And I am mm -hmm. so grateful for his generosity in, in time and insights with us. Um, Maria Siambekos, who is a healthcare tech executive with over 25 years of experience. She's already had two successful exits under her belt. And she's amazing to evaluate 
tech stacks, organizations, how to get them to scale, how fast can we go? Mm -hmm. um, Ellen Rednick, professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago, and who had a career of 20 years in healthcare prior to that. And last but not least, uh, Fiji Simo, um, who is currently CEO of Instacart, used to be head of apps at Facebook, and more importantly, recently launched a startup called Metro Doha, literally this week for addressing unmet needs in women's health. She's mm -hmm. been very open about her own condition that mm -hmm. is underdiagnosed and does not have a cure part. And so she basically pursued her calling and um, put the resources together to figure out a cure before her own daughter might actually have it so that oh, she wow. really fixes the generations um, to go. And so there are dozens of other people that are supporting us that I'm, I don't, I'm not able to name today, but um, this is a movement and I'm excited by the energy that, that goes into it. And finally, I have to thank my amazing investors because we, we started from scratch and, mm -hmm. and really they went out on the limb to help us out, build the first deals. We've closed three investments and really it's thanks to them. That's what an incredible team and a great call to action. I think I can definitely even see that everyone seems so rallied behind supporting women's health and supporting, I think, just, you know, digital health care um, and empowering, you know, consumers to actually take that into their own hands. So mm -hmm. I think that is so incredible. Um, what are some of, you know, kind of thinking about the what you're doing right now or maybe even the past? What are some of the projects that you either are currently involved in or that you've invested in that you are passionate about? Yes. Um, so we um, made three investments so far. And one I am truly excited about, I mean, I'm excited about them all, obviously. But in, in, in women's health, um, we invested behind a company called um, Alloy Health. It's a direct to consumer telemedicine company for women over 40 years old and going through menopause. So it's led by a very high caliber management team. We were blown away the day we met them. It, uh, you have Monica Molena, who is a serial entrepreneur and had a, she had a hysterectomy at the age of 40 um, mm -hmm. uh, and went through menopause overnight with no information that this was about to happen and how wow. to sort it out, not feeling herself. And that sent her on a journey to discover that actually the field is completely overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, the second CEO is Anne Fullenwinder, the former editor-in-chief of Marie Claire, um, you know, one of the leading publications for uh, women in that age trench, including mm -hmm. me. I love it. Um, <laughs> their chief medical officer is Dr. Sharon Malone, an OBGYN um, focused on issues of menopause and who did a podcast with uh, former first lady Michelle Obama about a year ago to try to remove the stigma around mm -hmm. uh, menopause. Together, they are bringing uh, to market a platform to address the needs holistically of women going through that phase of life. Because um, let's face it, menopause is considered a wellness issue not a medical mm. one. It's like puberty in reverse. Yeah. Um, and because nobody dies from menopause, there is very little research that go into it. It's not a great cause of concern um, from the medical community. In fact, they're really trained on the issue. Um, and I would say, um, uh, even though <laughs> I say women don't die from menopause, on my own investor base, many women said, Julia, hold on until you get there, <laughs> and then you will revisit that statement. The reality is women are miserable going through mm -hmm. menopause. Some have very acute symptoms. And, and by the way, um, there is research and data that now shows menopause cross um, uh, racial lines. And, um, symptoms oh, wow. are longer and more acute for women of color. And, and there is not a ton of research to explain why and also what we can do to, to support them. Yeah. So because of all this, um, uh, the team decided to start Alloy Health. Um, and they are working to bring telemedicine products, support, mental health um, for, to support women going through, through that phase. And we could not be more excited to, to help them and support them as, as they launch the business. That is incredible. It, it is really interesting, I think, 
um, even just for my own, you know, research uh, through Kaiser, we kind of do a lot of market scans and we always see that there's so much, um, you know, energy and excitement and companies really focusing on the first part of a woman's life, you know, from menstruation, yeah. contraception, fertility, pregnancy, but really not so much after. So I think that is so incredible. And that sounds like an amazing platform. Yes. And it has to do with the generations of um, techies and, and millennials, <laughs> basically, that have more resources to yeah. the, the willingness or the competencies to launch tech oriented startups. There, there is data that suggests it, it, there's really an over proportion there. But mm -hmm. the management is said, no, this one we do it because we're going through it and we need to put it out in the market. And it's not just about um, delivering a product. There is actually a lot of um, a number of evidence-based solutions to mm -hmm. support women, but there's also, also an issue of access to right. menopause trained and certified doctors. You take the state of Maine, there's only one OBGYN that's actually really? certified on, yes, on the issues of wow. menopause. So it, it, it takes a village to actually move this forward. It's not a, about, it's not just about sending the right probiotics to women or advising them on lifestyle. It's really about making the connection and, and changing the narrative. But going through menopause is, is taboo. It's not something we feel particularly proud about. And mm -hmm. so can we actually feel beautiful about it? And, and that's why I love the team. That's, that's so incredible. Um, and, and we were kind of touching on this a little bit, just really how menopause is one of those areas that is already, um, you know, overlooked in an already overlooked industry of, of women's health. Um, that's kind of getting that resurgence and really, you know, being brought into the spotlight. Um, based off of your experiences, what are some other things that you're seeing um, or some other trends that you're seeing in the women's health space kind of going forward? Yes. And the I'm really excited by all the activity that goes on in the early stage space. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of activity, as you've described, around earlier stages of life in women's mm -hmm. health, tracking periods, trying to get a hold of it a little bit, of some amount of control, a lot of activity around pregnancy, yeah. period and postpartum, which is so deeply needed. I, I, I have kids and you can see the lack of connection to the medical community during pregnancy, mm -hmm. especially after delivery. Right. There are so many opportunities for text to stand up and really make a difference around infertility and reproductive mm -hmm. health is another one where research has crashed the surface, but not that far. If there was more data, we could really, really push the envelope. Right. And so I'd say that all leads to an awakening around women's conditions at large and the mm -hmm. fact that there could be new research in brand new fields that we did not tackle before. As I said, women were excluded from clinical trials until mm -hmm. 1993. And so, you know, society kind of tells us pain is part of being a woman. So there are many conditions that are completely under-researched. Endometriosis is one, and there are many others like this, where with data and technology, we can now lower the costs of putting out a product to try to track and understand what goes on. And that really gives me, keeps me excited about the field. And I think we will have um, a lot to do in the next decade. But I, I'll give one word here. I remember when I uh, started uh, 15 years ago, sitting in front of um, a very senior woman on the investment side who said, I thought the tide was changing when I started in the early 1990s. And yet we're still where we are, we were 30 years ago. So mm -hmm. um, what I hope we do differently this time is we really push it forward and we make it happen. That's, yes, <laughs> that, that is something I can definitely get behind. Absolutely agree. Uh, just given, you know, your, your long and, and very robust career and, and journey that, you know, has led you to this point here, what are some of the challenges or the areas of opportunities um, or areas of growth that you kind of you've observed, um, you know, along your journey? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, uh, my profile is somewhat unusual, right? Um, it has created challenges. It also made me who I am. And I think it created opportunities. And, and that's at least how I want to think about it. I identify as a female. 
women investors are still in the single digit percentages in the VC industry, so little. So no wonder it's hard for women-led businesses to, to raise capital. There are just so few of us on, on the other side to understand and, and help them in a different way. So mm -hmm. I know I have now the privilege of uh, looking at Femtech and, and be supportive of women-led businesses. And they will know my door is open to uh, have conversations. These may not be areas where I can eventually invest into, but if they need somebody to go to rent, I'm always here. Um, and so I would say in this country, I, I'm aware I'm, I'm white and it came with certain privileges in the US. Mm -hmm. I'm also an immigrant with an accent. Um, and I'm lucky in some ways that um, French is so, sometimes perceived uh, positively, <laughs> depending <laughs> on where diplomacy is at. Um, but, you know, it turns out to be um, very unhelpful in situations where I might need to assert authority or draw a line. People do develop analogic reaction because mm -hmm. there's a different perception. And so um, it's definitely something I'm, I stay aware of. But I would say it has also opened many opportunities. 25% mm -hmm. um, of the startup founders are immigrants. Uh, mm -hmm. We all come from there. Uh, growing abroad made us see gaps faster right. than others. Um, yeah. There's a re recent HBR study that says um, we have a higher risk tolerance than, than others. <laughs> <laughs> so, bias towards action, challenger mentality mm -hmm. against the status quo. Let's go charge for the heels. Yep. Um, and I definitely relate to that. So <laughs> I want to share that with you audience mm -hmm. be unapologetic about who you are own it and and make it happen if you have a dream and a vision and something you see that should be there and you can see a market for it go go for it the world will be a better place because of that that's so beautiful um and definitely i think i really love that you know reframing something that could have been a challenge as an opportunity um as something that you know is just another um, you know, milestone or something to remember that is part of your identity. So I think that is a beautiful reframing. Um, and then kind of going off of what you were, you know, just talking about kind of speaking to the audience directly, what advice do you have for those who are interested either in entrepreneurship or in um, becoming an investor? Yeah, for sure. So um, starting pace was um, on my mind for a long time. Um, I always thought I would have another job before doing it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a it's a women bias too. It's like, can, if I had more skills and more credentials and more network, then I'd be really a lot more confused to do it mm -hmm. um, before venturing on our own. But the opportunity sort of presented itself. It was now the time. Um, and even though I lacked some of the basic resources and we started from, from scratch, I'm so glad we decided to go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, don't overlook the fact it can be slightly psychotic. I have mm -hmm. um, young children too. So I'm, I'm a mom and we juggle through, through all of this. And that's why I'm also so extremely grateful for the team behind Pace and the advisors because they are the glue that also hold it um, mm -hmm. all together. Um, they all rallied around the idea, the vision, how can we do it differently? And so um, I'm really proud about what we have um, achieved in a short period of time and the efforts we've put into it. And there's still a long, long way to go. But as, as a consequence, I'd say, if, if you are in a place where you see something, but you're hesitating, um, it's worth stepping out of your comfort zone, having your legs shake a little bit and, and just push for it. It's, it's a good time to do it. That's, I love that. If, and I, I think know, I'm coming to recruit you. Kaiser Permanente doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. That sounds amazing. I think you just seem so, and I think it's, it's so evident, just so mission driven. And I think that that is so important. Um, and I think probably really is kind of what makes a lot of these, what could be, you know, very nerve wracking decisions seem all that easier because, you know, it's it's going towards something very meaningful. Yes, especially for these entrepreneurs that may not have had startups experience before, but they know a space, they understand the sector better than anybody else. They see the gap and they see the opportunity and the solution. So really, it, it's it's. Um, 
I encourage them and I'm just so excited by um, all the women entrepreneurs I, I get the chance to see and meet. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, I know uh, with that, we're, we're a little bit um, out from nine. So I wanted to uh, you know, wrap things up and thank you again, Julia, for this amazing conversation. Um, I think it has been so um, enlightening, even for myself, um, kind of hearing your journey and really what you stand for. So thank you so much. Um, Thanks and to you. Of course. And with that, we have a, another um, Women's Health Tech Wednesday coming up as well. Um, so please be sure to check that out. We'll be having another conversation with Ashima Gupta from Google. And also wanted to let the group know one last time that the applications for the Women's Health Tech Challenge are still running. Um, the deadline is October 20th. So please be sure to apply and also stay in touch with us on social media so that you can get updates and reminders for all of these events. I wanted to thank you again, Julia, for an amazing conversation. Um, and Julia's information to connect is also available in the chat for those who want to reach out. Um, and also wanted to thank our sponsor, Goodwin, for sponsoring this conversation and giving me a, an opportunity to uh, chat with Julia. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, HIT Lab. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>